following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. As we have outlined for you in the previous lectures, meditation is an exact science that's founded upon a very severe logic. In other words, <clears throat> to learn how to meditate requires that you understand the science, the steps, and the practical aspects. Meditation is not a process of beliefs or assumptions. It is something very exact. And so to learn how to meditate, you have to study, you have to practice. And you mostly, most of all need to develop the ability, the capacity to question yourself. To question your own practice to analyze and revise your own procedures, your own process. And this is the, the most effective way to make quick progress in your own practice of meditation. The most important central concept that has to become a practical reality in yourself in order to meditate successfully is to understand what your consciousness is. This is the most important thing. To be able to know, recognize, and work with your own consciousness. If this escapes you, if you're not clear about this practically in your experience, in yourself, Meditation will always be elusive. It will be something that you won't understand. Meditation itself is an exercise or a function of consciousness. It is to work with consciousness. We all use this word consciousness. We discuss it. We debate about it. But the theory or the intellectual idea is meaningless if we don't have a practical grasp in our daily life, our moment-to-moment -moment life, of what our own consciousness is and how it functions. In Gnosis, we call the consciousness essence. And this is because it is the the elixir or the, the synthesis of being, the suchness of a being. It is the capacity of being sentient, of having perception, to perceive, to see, to apprehend, not merely with senses or sense organs, Consciousness is not limited by physical matter. 
such as the five senses that we have physically. Consciousness is a function that is beyond matter. And that's why when we dream, we can have consciousness outside of the body. When you die, you can have consciousness outside of the body. That consciousness is what we work with in meditation. And this is why, in the lectures leading up to today, we have rigorously analyzed practical techniques, methods to work with consciousness, to recognize it, to work with it, to use it. And this is what sets up the fundamental uh, basis within which meditation can flourish. In Buddhism, the essence has a number of different names. Uh, a common one is Buddha Dhatu. In Tibetan Buddhism, particularly in the writings of Maitreya, the scriptures from Maitreya, you might also encounter the term Tathagatagarva. These terms are synonymous with each other. And they mean Buddha nature, or the embryo of a Buddha. And this is an important concept to grasp. What it explains to us is that we have within us the seed of a Buddha, Datu. So in that context, we would need to know what is a Buddha. The word Buddha, of course, is also a Sanskrit term. It's most commonly translated to English to mean awakened one. So then we understand that there is not one Buddha, although in common language we, we tend to think that way. We think of the Buddha in reference to Gautama Shakyamuni. But the reality is that any awakened being, I mean truly awakened, is a Buddha. And we would say in this case, Jesus is a great Buddha. Moses, Krishna, Katsal, Kual, even Muhammad, many other great masters and prophets became Buddhas. They awakened their consciousness. Within us, we have that same capacity. We have Buddha Dattu, the seed or embryo of a Buddha. In order to create that, for that Buddha to emerge, for that awakened being to emerge, we need to work with this essence or Buddha nature. And that is the consciousness itself. When we talk about awakening, we're talking about awakening new levels of perception. Consciousness is that perception. The awakening is of new forms of seeing, insight, understanding, wisdom, knowledge. Some traditions call it omniscience, omnipotence. And truly, a Buddha has that. And that's why we have so many great stories about religion, religious prophets and avatars who have great powers, great wisdom, great insight. That comes from the awakened consciousness, the Buddha Dhatu that has become Buddha. So we begin in any religion with consciousness, working with consciousness trying to discriminate and understand what is that. We've explained in previous lectures that that beginning, the recognition of consciousness in us, begins with conscience. That part of us that senses right from wrong. That natural ethic, which is intuitive and felt in the heart. The conscience. In us, it's quite weak. It's quite small. It's hard to hear it. It's hard to distinguish it because the mind is so loud and so strong. Therefore, we 
discuss, we analyze, we study the very first of the three trainings, ethics, ethical discipline, renunciation. In this level, in any religion, we learn how to behave, how to learn, how to feel, to sense, to do what is right, and avoid and stop what is wrong. So in the first few lectures, we've been talking about ethical discipline, what real ethics means. The purpose of that is not for us to just imitate the behaviors of someone else. It is instead to sense and know in our own heart what is right, to know it, not from imitation, not from memorization, but to know it in your heart because you know it's true. That is conscience. That is real ethical discipline. And that is renunciation also. Real renunciation is a spontaneous, natural truth in the heart. We tend to think of renunciation as something painful. Like it must be painful to renounce material goods and go live as a monk or a nun. Or to renounce sex and go be a priest. Or to renounce our family and go live in a monastery or a cave. This is not what we're talking about with renunciation. Real renunciation is to renounce wrong action. And not just physically. Psychologically. It is to renounce doing what you know is wrong. And when you truly adopt that attitude consciously, this is not unpleasant. It's liberating. When truly in your heart you stop doing things you know you shouldn't do, this is not a bondage on you. It's a liberation. You free yourself from wrong action. You free yourself from creating harmful consequences. You liberate yourself from the burden of the desire, the fear, the anger, the pride that was driving you. This is the basis of liberation. We all talk about liberation, enlightenment, yoga, religion, union with God. This is where it begins. It begins now with our ethics. It begins now in our moment-to-moment -moment awareness of what's processing in our heart and mind and discriminating between conscious ethic and ego. No one can tell you the difference. No one can give you a big, complicated structure of your ego and say, you shouldn't do these things, and then give you a big, complicated structure of right things to do and say, you should do these things. Because those actions and behaviors may not correspond directly to your own psychology. Only you can resolve what is right and what is wrong. And this is because each one of us has our own karma, we have our own psychology, we have our own weaknesses, and we have our own strengths. We have to resolve this problem for ourselves. And the resolution of that is precisely in comprehending, in experiencing what the essence is, what our consciousness is, what our conscience is. So in this level of teaching that we've been describing, the whole purpose is to come to recognize the consciousness in oneself and to work with karma, cause and effect. It is also to recognize the inevitability of death and the pervasiveness of impermanence. These are the fundamental characteristics of this level of instruction. And this level is true in every religion. But they're presented in this structural form in Buddhism. So we use this as a model to help us understand religions. Most of all, to help us understand 
how to go ahead in our own spiritual work. These factors or this way of looking at a spiritual path is at the level of a sutrayana or shravakayana teachings. These are introductory or fundamental level instruction. Some people call it hinayana, but we don't like to use that word. This level of instruction is absolutely essential. In fact, most of us probably are not ready to leave it. And this is proven not by our intellectual understanding of the teaching, not by being able to, rec- to recite scriptures or discuss these structures at great length. What defines our ability, our readiness to move on, is our comprehension of them and our actions from moment to moment. If we are truly, spontaneously, living a life of ethical discipline, truly controlling our mind, truly developing a natural, intuitive comprehension of the effects of our actions, and that truly having the longing to be a better person and to stop behaving in harmful ways, then we've started to establish a basis of renunciation. We've started to experience it. Another hallmark of this readiness for transition is a natural, spontaneous longing to stop the cycle of suffering. Even if it's only for ourselves. But rarely do we see this. Rarely. Even amongst people who study religion, who are very devoted to their spiritual life. Rarely do we see a natural, intuitive, spontaneous desire or longing to stop the cycle of suffering. Many spiritual people just love to feel spiritual and love to be involved in their groups or following their teacher or going to retreats and temples. But continuing with their same behaviors, not really changing, just imitating new behaviors. But in their heart, in their mind, they continue to be the same person. They continue with their same pride, their same lust, their same envy. When we really comprehend, when we really know about karma, when we're seeing it in ourselves as an example, when we see that our anger makes us suffer and we feel remorse for that, and moreover, we see that our anger makes other people suffer and we feel remorse for that and we sincerely want to stop That is a good sign. It's a good sign. It's a sign of renunciation emerging naturally. The the longing to renounce that anger, to stop that, to change that. Not merely to cover it up and hide from it, which is usually what we do. We usually justify ourselves. We say, that guy did that to me. Do you see what he did to me? He did this and this and this. He is really bad. This is not renunciation. This is justifying, blaming, criticizing. None of that will change anything. It will only make things worse. Real renunciation, real ethical discipline, is, has a hallmark, which is self-criticism. It is sincerity, to honestly see oneself. Instead of blaming others, attacking, always blaming outside and justifying oneself, Real renunciation is marked by this statement. This is happening because it's my karma. This is very different from blaming everybody else. 
When you have real renunciation, real ethical discipline emerging in yourself, you no longer complain. You no longer blame others. You no longer justify yourself. You no longer excuse yourself. You no longer seek someone to pin it on, like your spouse or your boss or your friends or the people in the other car, or the people on the other side of the street, or your neighbors. You don't blame them anymore. You then begin to see, this is happening because it's my karma. This situation has arisen because I have latent tendencies or predispositions in my mind stream that are allowing it to happen. It's happening because I deserve it. It's happening because I have pride, because I have anger, because I have fear, and I need to change. This is real renunciation. This is very rare. Furthermore, this level of ethical discipline leads one naturally to something new. It is the recognition that if I continue the way I am, I will never escape suffering. How many of us comprehend that? It's a great truth. If we really want liberation from suffering, we have the opportunity right now. We're all hearing the teaching. We're all receiving the instructions. We all have the opportunity. We have a physical body. We have a mind that is relatively stable, at least stable enough to understand something of the knowledge, the teaching. This is our moment. Are we taking advantage of it? Truly? Today, every day? Harnessing that opportunity to use it? If we are, it's because we comprehend impermanence and death to some degree. We know. If we don't do it now, it won't happen. So there's an urgency that's also present in renunciation, real renunciation. The synthesis of all of what I'm explaining is that we need to grasp something essential. We are suffering because of our mind, because of delusions that are inside of us, not because of anything outside. We suffer because of ourselves. The only way to change that is if we do it. No one can do it for us. And the way to change it is to eliminate the delusions. Those delusions have many names. We've talked about them throughout these lectures. Anger, pride, envy, gluttony, avarice, laziness. All those different qualities, the ten non-virtuous actions, the seven deadly sins, the egos, the aggregates. Many ways to approach looking at the delusions. But the most fundamental delusion, the one that supports all of them, is ignorance. Ignorance is not a lack of knowledge. It is a lack of attention. To ignore means to not pay attention, right? If I say, well, I'm going to ignore you now, it means I'm not going to pay attention to you. This is what we mean by ignorance. But this ignorance is of the truth. You see, all of us are willingly ignoring the truth. Willfully. Because we grasp at a self, at a concept that isn't real. Our personality, our name, our background, our history, our memories, our desires, our longings, our resentment, our anger, our remorse, our lust, our envy, our jealousy, all of these are a sense of self that we grasp at. This is our fundamental ignorance. We ignore that that grasping creates karma. That karma is our suffering. So the synthesis is, to eliminate suffering, we have to eliminate the delusion. And that delusion is only eliminated through knowledge. 
through wisdom, through understanding. This is why we study the three trainings. We need a profound wisdom, which is the third training. In Sanskrit, it's called prana. It's also called bodhi. You've all heard that the Buddha awakened his consciousness at the foot of the bodhi tree. But the word bodhi and Buddha come from the same root, bud, awake. You see, the Buddha awakens his consciousness through wisdom. Bodhi is also translated as wisdom. To acquire that wisdom requires that we have a stable mind. If the mind, if our consciousness is not stable, serene, we cannot perceive the truth. So to reach wisdom, we need a stable mind. This is why we need concentration, equanimity, mental stability, calm abiding, pratyahara, dhyana, dharana, many names for this state of consciousness. Concentration balances an unbalanced mind. Our mind is very unbalanced. From one moment to the next, we change directions completely. We can completely contradict ourselves from one minute to the next. Inexplicably, because we don't have control over what emerges in our mind. None of us yet have the ability to stop thinking, right? But we should. A real human being can stop thought. The Buddha demonstrated that. Jesus demonstrated that. Any master can do that. It's no great feat. It's natural, normal. But we've lost that capacity because our mind is out of balance. We need concentration to solve that. But concentration cannot emerge because the mind is so out of balance, because our ethics are all wrong. By performing wrong actions, the mind is filled with negative energy. We're so filled with desire, with fear, with longing, with lust, with anger, with pride, with anxiety, that the mind is chaotic, like an ocean in a storm. That mind cannot settle and be a smooth mirror to reflect the universe as long as we keep filling it with so much energy, negative energy, active energy. So these three trainings help us. With ethics, we stabilize our behaviors. We stop performing wrong actions. We produce right actions. And the energies become in harmony with nature, our psychological and spiritual energy. When that happens, we can then concentrate. Our mind starts to settle. And when the mind becomes settled, it becomes a natural mirror in its natural state, which is rigpa that mind can reflect the truth, prana. And then we see. Then we know. Then we start to awaken. It's very simple to explain. But it takes a lot of effort to make it happen. This process is... Uh, universal in all religions, even if it isn't broken down in these steps, and even if the religions have lost it now. And it's because this process is the basic structure for any path to liberation from suffering. In every religion, we've always had ethics, prayer or meditation, and then the access to the knowledge of God. Every religion has this. What's different, though, is when we start to look at the upper levels of the path and understand that there are real differences in how these factors are applied depending upon the quality of our mind stream. So I apologize, but it's going to get a little more complicated now. For you to understand this, it's important. You see, these trainings 
particularly the, the aspect that I've been describing, which is renunciation, comprehending karma and death, and working with the consciousness. In Buddhist terms, we would call this sutrayana or shravakyana. This is foundational level instruction, even if it's in a Christian tradition or an Islamic tradition. This essential concept remains the same. This effort to apply ethics and awaken consciousness is primarily concerned with oneself. It's primarily concerned with liberating oneself from one's own suffering. And many achieve it. We call them saints, prophets, holy people, angels, even Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, or Nirvanis, or Pratyeka Buddhas, or Shravakas. You see, to acquire liberation for oneself is not that difficult of a task. And this is proven if you happen to awaken your consciousness and visit Nirvana, or any realm of heaven. You'll find many beings there. You'll find many yogis, monks, who learned how to apply an ethic, who learned to concentrate or pray, and free themselves from some degree of ego, awaken their consciousness to some degree, and thereby earned a period of repose or rest in nirvana or heaven. And so they enter that state and enjoy the bliss of nirvana. Nirvana means cessation. It's talking about the cessation of suffering. And to enter that state is not exceedingly difficult. This is why we hear all the time of sages or yogis or monks or, or um, different religious leaders who enter samadhi or who have states of ecstasy and then come back from that state and say, oh, I've reached liberation. You can worship me now. And many do. But this is not real liberation. In fact, the difficulty is when we follow a teaching like that, any yoga or religion that leads to experiencing those states, we can also believe that this is liberation. That an experience in nirvana or becoming an arhat or a stream enterer, whatever terms are used in the religion, is it. That's it. That's the end. It isn't. It can be proven easily. When we observe those saints or angels or Buddhas or divas, and they become attached to those experiences, they have pride. They have envy. Jealousy of the others at that level. They become attached to the sensations of nirvana. At death, their essence escapes and rises naturally to the level that they have attained in their development, and they remain there for a period of time, according to karma. And they sincerely believe they have acquired liberation because they're experiencing blissful states. Depending on the precise level or degree of liberation that they have acquired. But unfortunately, it is also impermanent. It only sustains itself as long as the karma allows it. But because their mind stream is still afflicted in its depths, in the subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious levels, that period of repose will end, and that soul will once more have to take birth in some lower realm. And once again, try to reach liberation. The reason, the reason this happens is simply because of karma. An experience of samadhi, an experience of nirvana is not liberation. In fact, it can be a form of attachment. It can be a form of suffering. We tend to think that at our level, at the humanoid level, 
in this material plane that the greatest ecstasy that we can experience is sexual. It isn't. It's not even a fraction of what the consciousness can experience in nirvana. So let's think about that for a moment. We see humanity is incredibly attached to lust. Humanity fights tooth and nail to defend their lust, to indulge in it. And yet that experience of sexuality or the orgasm is extremely brief and cannot be sustained. Moreover, it damages the organism and the brain. But that brief experience, as intense as it may be or pleasurable as it may be, is not even a fraction of what you can experience in nirvana. Not even a fraction. So can you imagine how much attachment you could have to an experience in nirvana? If we already have attachment to sensations physically, what about sensations in the consciousness? The attachment must be incredible. The seduction of it. The temptation of it. When we consider it that way, it makes sense why so many people, in working on their path to liberation, stop they might be able to renounce actions that create pain, but can they renounce actions that produce pleasure? Not easy. Most don't. The vast majority of souls who enter the path to liberation become diverted at this stage. They enter the spiral path, the path of the Buddha's pratyekas, and the shravakas. They become attached to pleasurable sensations. They become attached to bliss, nirvana. Let me state it to you clearly now. This is not that path. Gnosis is not the path of the Buddha's pratyekas or shravakas. This is not a nirvanic path. You can reach nirvana through what we teach but we don't recommend it. What we teach in this tradition is the straight path. It's the middle path. It's the path that renounces pain and pleasure. The path that goes beyond them to wisdom, to prana. This path is very different. It isn't new. It's ancient. It's the oldest path in the universe. It's called the path of the bodhisattva. Here's this word bodhi again. Bodhi means wisdom, but it relates with the mind. It relates with awakening. It's from that root for Buddha. And it's combined with the, the Sanskrit term sattva. Sattva is a very deep and rich word. It has many applications. It's very subtle. But in this context, it means the essence of, or the vehicle of. So a bodhisattva is an essence of wisdom, or an essence of awakening. A bodhisattva is a person, a mind stream, who goes beyond pleasure and pain, who goes beyond self interest, grasping itself. A bodhisattva is someone who has comprehended karma to such a degree that they want to help others escape suffering. This is different. You see a Buddha, Pratyeka, or a Shravaka, these are types of beings who achieve liberation and reach nirvana for themselves. They may have love for others. They may speak of love for others but their actions reveal their identity. Their actions reveal self-interest, self-protection, self-liberation. And this is fine, but it is not the whole path. It is only an antechamber. 
A bodhisattva goes far beyond that. A great example of a bodhisattva is Jesus. In his every action, his every word, was concern for the well-being of others, never himself. Another great example is Padma Sambhava, the great Buddha of Tibet, of Tibetan Buddhism. Another is Milarepa. Another is Joan of Arc. These are great bodhisattvas who acted on behalf of others, giving up anything for themselves in order to help others. The reason that this concept of the bodhisattva is important is because renunciation, ethical discipline, or that sutrayana level of instruction cannot take us all the way to the heights of liberation. It can take us to nirvana, but that's it. To go beyond that level, you need to comprehend what is beyond that level. What is beyond nirvana? Christ. Avalokiteshvara. Chinrezi. Katsal Kuan Kuanyin. Many names for this light. The light of Bodhi, the light of wisdom, Hokmah. It is compassion, cognizant love. It is a type of virtue, a type of mind stream that is far beyond even the mind of a Buddha. It is a type of mind that is different. In Sanskrit, we call that type of mind bodhicitta. So now we've talked about a few words that use this bodhi. A bodhisattva is the being, the person. But what distinguishes them is bodhicitta. Chitta means mind. It's also Sanskrit. So bodhicitta would mean awakening mind, wisdom mind. But this is not a thing. It is not an item. It is not a matter. It is not even really an energy. Bodhicitta is a descriptive term. We talk about it like it is a thing, but in reality, it is your mind itself, but different. You see, we all have a mind stream. We call it essence, buddhadhatu, tathagatagarbha, these different names. But what is our mind stream characterized by? Right now, it's characterized by ignorance, by grasping at a false self. Further than that, it's characterized by the conditioning of anger, of pride, of lust, of envy, jealousy, fear, anxiety, many negative states. And even in our best moments, the moments we could say define our life, our capacity for selfless action is still very limited. Look sincerely at your life. What stage of life are you in? How much more do you have to go? We don't know, right? But if you look back at your few decades that you've been alive, which moments would you call out as the defining best moment when you did the best you could possibly do with your human existence? What characterizes it? What qualities are there? Can you even find such a moment? Many people cannot. Many people are just here, not knowing why, not knowing what for, and not knowing what to do. We just exist halfway, not even alive. Some few of us might find a moment or two when we really did something good for another person. But in the majority of cases, it would be for somebody like a spouse 
or a parent or a child, someone we should have done something good for. How often have we done something truly good for someone else? Someone not in our family, someone we don't know, or even an enemy. What makes us human? We have to ask ourselves that. We believe that we're the best creatures on this planet. Why? Because we make technology gadgets? Is this what it means to be human? Has that really improved our situation? Has the internet really improved life on this planet? Or cars? Or weapons, which is mostly what we make? Has our addiction to robbing the earth of its resources really improved life? Is there less starvation and poverty and loneliness and suffering on this planet because of our technology? No. Most measurements say all those conditions are worse. There's less clean water on this planet than there ever has been. There's more starvation on this planet than there ever has been. There is more slavery on this planet than there ever has been. I'm not making these things up. These are statistics you can go and look at. These are facts. So what makes us human? What makes us so great? It is the capacity to do good. The capacity. But do we do it? Having the capacity to do something is not the same thing as doing it. If you have the ability to act but do not, you commit a crime. Simple. We're judged by the results of our actions, not by our intentions. Karma doesn't measure your intentions. It measures what you do and what you do not do. So what makes us human? It's an important question. Can we really answer it? Is it because we have this type of body? Two arms and two legs? Does that make a human being? Even the apes have those. It can't be that. Is it having our brain? Even the apes have those. Even a monkey has a brain like ours. Well, let's look at our behavior. Is that what makes us human? If we look at our life and we see what scientists see, scientists believe that humans are characterized by violence and instinct. Scientists state that our natural predisposition is for violence, for competition. Why do they think that? It isn't true, by the way. It's a misconception that they have because of the ego. There's some science now that's starting to realize that that assumption is mistaken. They're starting to actually look at what happens with children and that babies naturally have altruism, compassion, a natural longing to help. But as they get older, it's squashed by the ego, by our culture, by personality. So what is it that makes us human? Consciousness. The essence is what makes us human. But if we look at our behaviors, if we look at our society, we really don't see much difference from us and animals. Because our society, our planet, behaves like animals. Addicted to violence, to lust, to competition. In fact, in many cases, animals behave better than we do. Animals don't destroy their own habitat. Animals don't destroy their own food and water supply. Animals naturally help each other to survive. We do not. Even an animal can show gratitude. If you feed or care for an animal, they will show you gratitude. We don't. When we are fed and clothed, we respond with bitterness 
viciousness. Rarely do we have sincere gratitude. An animal can show generosity, can show altruism. We rarely show them. An animal can protect another animal, even of another species. How often do we do that? We don't even protect each other. We claim to be in love with our spouse. We get married. We make all these big vows to protect each other. Within a short period of time, we're at each other's throats. We claim to love our parents and our children, but our mind is filled with resentment towards them. We hear children, little kids saying, I hate my brother. I hate my mother. Why? Is this human? These are facts of our existence that we must analyze and understand. And it's because of this, because of the qualities of our mind, because of the level of this humanity, that mere renunciation is not enough. Humanity now has had thousands of years of religions teaching ethical discipline. Thousands of years, and we have continued to get worse. We think that we're better nowadays, but there is no evidence of that anywhere on this planet. We are the same barbarians we have always been. Moreover, we're getting worse and worse because we're justifying ourselves, we're lying to ourselves, and we're hiding our crimes beneath a veneer of sanctity. We have this society that is supposedly so advanced, but it merely is a shell covering a heart of corruption to which we can barely look because we all know it's true, but we can't bear the thought of it. Mere renunciation is not enough. Mere ethics is not enough. These thousands of years of learning the Ten Commandments and the different vows and the different behaviors has not improved our situation. Either, either as individuals or as a race. We need something more. We need the next level of instruction. We need to go beyond Sutriyana, Shravakayana level, the foundation. We need a greater vehicle. In Sanskrit, it is called Mahayana. We need the Mahayana level the greater instruction. What distinguishes this next level? One thing, bodhicitta. No matter what religion you practice, no matter what culture you come from, whether you're a male or a female, a child or an old person, if you want to go beyond the current state of suffering on this planet, you cannot do it through ethics alone. You need bodhicitta. This means awakening mind. But it doesn't mean simply to awaken, because even in the sutrayana level, the introductory level, you awaken consciousness. Bodhicitta is a different kind of mind stream completely different from the foundational level. It isn't a thing. It isn't a noun. It is a state, a quality, an aura, a presence. Bodhicitta not only can mean awakening mind, it can be defined as cognizant compassion. Conscious love is something beyond the mind that we have now. It's a kind of mind that gives without thought for self. So to explain this, I'll read you a little scripture from Tsongkhapa. He wrote this in a scripture called Three Fundamental Paths, which we quoted from in one of the earlier lectures in this series. 
It says this. Renunciation alone can never bring the total bliss of matchless Buddhahood unless it is bound by the purest wish, which is bodhicitta. And so the wise seek the high wish, bodhicitta, for enlightenment. Those swept along four fierce river currents, chained up tight in past deeds, hard to undo, stuffed in a steel cage of grasping self, smothered in the pitch-black ignorance. In a limitless round they are born, and in their births are tortured by the three sufferings without a break. Think how your mothers feel. Think of what is happening to them. Try to develop this highest wish, bodhicitta. This line at the end of that passage that says, think of how your mothers feel, is based on a, a central Mahayana concept. Which is that when we comprehend that life is an eternal round of recurrences, of repeated existences, and that all of us are migrating through lifetime after lifetime. And this has been going on for countless ages. Then at some point, at some stage, every being has been your mother. Every being has been your child. Every being has been your sibling. And when you contemplate that, and you consider how much love your mother should have shown you. Maybe in this age it's not so common. But truly a mother's love for a child is distinct, unique. And the child feels that love in a distinct, unique way. And when you contemplate that and realize that all beings have shown you that kind of love, so selfless, and concerned only for you, then how can you allow them to suffer? It would be the same as watching your own mother now suffering, inexplicable pain, and yet you do nothing. This is a profound contemplation. It's something that you shouldn't just let flitter in and out of your intellect, but you should take it into your heart and think on that. If you have a troubled relationship with your own mother, then put in that place someone who has given you so much selfless love that you have so much gratitude. Think on that person. Reflect on that person. And then consider how many other beings have shown you that same love and compassion? Not merely in this lifetime, but other lifetimes. And what have you done to return the gesture? What are you doing now? Because you see, the situation you have now, the life you have now, was made possible by that generosity, by the love that that person showed you, whether a parent or a friend, a teacher, a sibling, a spouse. You have this moment, this life, because of that person. Don't you owe it to them to return the gesture? In Christianity, the Master Jesus came and was asked, Master, what is the greatest commandment of all? And he said, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is pure Mahayana Buddhism in Christianity. This is a teaching of pure bodhicitta. When you examine it. But it's given from a slightly different angle. You see, what Jesus is expressing is, the first commandment is to love your innermost. 
your inner Buddha, your inner divinity, your, the star that you came from, which we've lost complete touch with. We have no even idea about that. Most of us have not experienced it. When you experience that, that reality inside of you, that inner Buddha, which is completely different from the self that you think you are, you learn something emotionally, spiritually, that can never be conveyed. You become truly a child in the presence of your inner parent, your mother, your father, inside. And you feel a kind of love that is far beyond any terrestrial love, even the love of a parent for a child. Because the love that exists between your soul and your spirit is eternal. The love of a parent for a child is beautiful and deep, but generally it's from one existence, one life. If that love were sustained over many existences, over many thousands of years, millions of years, imagine the depth and richness and profundity of that love. That is the love that is there between your essence, your Buddha Dattu, your soul, and your spirit, your Buddha. When you taste that love, when you experience it, and you can and you will, if you persist in your efforts to meditate, then you can understand the statement by Jesus. Why that's the first commandment. When we forget that commandment is when we fall into mistakes in our ethical discipline. When we forget the God. When we forget our innermost. You see, if you remember the presence of your innermost, of your divine mother, of your divine father, if you actually are conscious that they are here and now with you, how can you allow lust to come into your mind? You can't. You can't even conceive of it. How could you allow pride to take a hold of your mind when you remember the presence of your innermost? You can't. It's inconceivable. That's real renunciation. That is real renunciation. Moreover, the teaching of Bodhicitta that Jesus, Jesus gave is right here. That same love that we feel spiritually, emotionally, inside towards our own innermost should be felt towards all beings because all beings have that same entity inside of them. So we should reflect on this great teaching from Jesus when we feel resentment towards another person. Who are you resenting? Because inside of that other person is also a Buddha, an innermost, something divine. Remember that. When you feel lust for another person, how can you show that towards the innermost, the divine mother of another person? Much, much less in the presence of your own Divine Mother. You see, this is not an intellectual game. This isn't just a theory. This is something that you have to do with deep awareness of yourself. Consistent. Persistent. Watchfulness of your mind. We call it self-observation. To observe oneself continually, the three brains, intellect, heart, body. But moreover, that self-observation has to be accompanied by self-remembering. And that remembering is the remembrance of your real self, your innermost, your Buddha. That divine spark that gave you life. That divine spark that is perfectly pure, eternal, and so unbelievably sacred. Remembering that presence gives you great power. Shall I say that again? To remember that presence gives you great power. 
Not power in the ego. Power in your consciousness. When you remember your being, when you put yourself consciously in a state of feeling the presence of God, you stimulate other senses, not just the physical ones. Self-observation and self-remembering are senses. It's not just an attitude. It isn't just a platitude or an affirmation that we make. It is a sense. It is a way of perception. You see, self-observation isn't something you can learn by imitating. It's something you learn by doing. And when you do it, it awakens senses in you that are now latent, asleep. This is what it means to awaken. We don't awaken the mind. We don't awaken beliefs. We awaken senses, perception, consciousness. This is different. That awakening cannot happen by imitating. It cannot happen with any trick. It cannot happen by force. It happens naturally, like anything in nature, as it's fed and nourished, gently, gradually, but persistently. What is cultivated here is that awakening of consciousness. But when we apply the two commandments, the two aspects that Jesus gave, we awaken in a different way. You see, Jesus was a teacher of Mahayana, the greater vehicle. And what defines it is this quality of bodhicitta. He didn't just say, remember God. If he had only said, remember your being, that would have been a teaching of Sutrayana, the foundation, basic. But he said, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is bodhicitta. That is compassion, love. Now, bodhicitta is a very deep topic, very complex. Complex for us because our mind has a hard time grasping it. it bodhicitta is not simply compassion. It is not simply love. Bodhicitta is far beyond that. It's characterized by two fundamental aspects, which in reality are the same thing. But to make it easier for our intellect, we talk about it as two, two faces. The first one is compassion, cognizant love, conscious love. This is relatively easy to understand conceptually, hard to do practically. The second aspect is wisdom, prana. But it isn't just wisdom being able to quote scripture. Bodhicitta is a mind that perceives. So this wisdom, the other aspect of bodhicitta, is the perception of the absolute. In other words, the elimination of ignorance. Bodhicitta, in its synthesis, whether it is relative bodhicitta or ultimate bodhicitta, is conscious love that sees the true nature of phenomena that doesn't suffer from the delusion of grasping at a self. Rather, it sees simultaneously in one cognitive moment without any artificial structure, conscious love and the emptiness of all things, the void, the absolute. For our intellect, this is really hard to grasp what that means. But at this point, we can say it is a way of seeing that is far beyond our way of seeing. It is a type of mind that sees things that we don't. We aspire to that, so we aspire to develop relative bodhicitta. And this is bodhicitta at our level. What this means is that we're aspiring not only to comprehend our karma, impermanence, the inevitability of death, we're also trying to learn how to be of service to others. You see, bodhicitta is defined not as a mental attitude, but as a way of life, a way of action. The Buddhas who accomplish the, the introductory path enter into nirvana and enjoy themselves and become enmeshed 
and that pleasure. And they don't leave. In fact, for them, they can't comprehend our suffering anymore because they don't experience it. In the same way, we can't really comprehend the pleasure that they experience. They cannot comprehend our pain. And even those bodhisattvas who go to the heavenly realms to try to convince those Buddhas to abandon nirvana and enter the straight path to help other beings, those Buddhas say, why? They should just come here and be with us. You bodhisattvas are crazy. Come and be here in nirvana with us. Have you ever heard of the tempting gods? Have you ever heard of the wars among the gods, the divas? These wars are recounted in every pantheon, in the Greek mysteries, in the Hindu mysteries like the Mahabharata or Ramayana. These wars and conflicts, these battles, these temptations among the gods exist. These gods or divas or jinns or beings who live in these heavenly realms and cannot bear to leave because they are attached. And many people on the planet Earth pray to them daily, thinking that those gods will come down and help them. Thousands of years have gone by. They haven't come down. The ones who come down are bodhisattvas. They are the ones who have renounced nirvana, who've renounced pain and pleasure to walk that middle path directly to the absolute, to the ultimate level of existence and non-existence. That level can only be reached through that middle path, through compassion, through wisdom. Those are the heights of Buddhahood or enlightenment or liberation. They cannot be reached through nirvana. They are reached through renouncing nirvana. The state of perfect equanimity exists at the very pinnacle of what we look at as the tree of life. It is that space, the gap, between the highest sephiroth and the absolute. There's a doorway there. No nirvani Buddha can reach it. It's impossible. They're too saturated with pleasure, with bliss. To reach that level is only possible when one has the scales in exact balance. That is, that soul owes nothing and is owed nothing. Perfect equanimity in every level psychologically. You cannot reach that if you're attached to lust, to anger, to envy, to pride, or to bliss. So this path is not easy, and very few enter it. It's very demanding. In order to help us accomplish it, we have a lot of tools. Most of the meditation tools and spiritual tools that we have all learned in our various religions and teachings belong to the foundational level, the Shravakayana level. And these would be tools like chanting mantras, prayer, meditation, runic exercises, yantra yoga, Lama Sri type practices, um, all kinds of bhakti or devotional yogas, jnana yoga, karma yoga, all of these forms of spiritual practice belong to the foundation level, all of them. To enter into the Mahayana level, there are very specific practices that one encounters. And generally speaking, they're kept secret in traditional religions. They're not taught openly. And this is simply because to enter into those levels, you have to be prepared. As I was explaining, you have to have that spontaneous renunciation and that spontaneous recognition that you want to help others and you need more tools to do it. And this is when Mahayana is introduced to you in whatever religion. In the Christian tradition, that those tools have been present in uh, the writings of 
of such authors as St. Francis or Thomas de Kempis. They both explained and expressed, and also uh, Teresa and um, St. John, and of course all the Gospels teach these Mahayana approaches to spiritual development. Of course, in um, Buddhism and Hinduism, these practices are fairly widespread, especially nowadays. You can encounter them. In Buddhism, there are two primary forms of the Mahayana practice of meditation that go beyond simple concentration practices, any preliminary practice. Uh, the two most famous ones are from one from the master Atisha, which is called the Seven Point Method, and another one from the master. Um, now it's escaping me. Shanti Deva, which is called exchanging the self and other. These are the two primary forms, and a lot of Tibetan Buddhist schools they practice these together. In their synthesis, they are also what Samael Vyor taught in his synthetic approach to the teaching. They are also what is taught in the Bhagavad Gita and what St. Francis expressed in his prayer. Many places you find this teaching. The essence of it is this. Put yourself in the place of other people. Not just from time to time, but consciously, continually. How would the other person feel? You see, we have this habit. We only think of ourselves all the time. This churning thought stream in our mind is all I, me, myself. All of it. And this is why Samael M. Vior said, 97% of human thoughts are harmful and negative. Some of us might be shocked by that. But observe your mind. You'll see it. It's true. Very rarely do we sincerely think of what will benefit another person. Very rare. Most of the time, it's all me, 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 singing our psychological song, all about me. You see, in our mind, we are the central character in a cosmic opera. And it's always a great tragedy. And we are always suffering at the hands of others wronged, betrayed, and everyone around us commits treason and no one understands us and we never get what we deserve, right? This is our song. I'm sorry if I'm revealing what you think is secret in your mind, but everybody else around you thinks the same thing. Nobody sees you the way you see yourself because the way you see yourself is a lie. To really enter the higher path that has to be stopped. It has to be inverted. What characterizes a mind stream that has bodhicitta is this quality, concern for others, not for oneself. I'll tell you something even more amazing. When I was talking about what makes us human, we reflect on our life. We can find very few examples of really doing something truly good for another person without being asked, without wanting praise, without wanting feedback or recognition. It's very rare. A bodhisattva lives that way. It's not just that they do something every once in a while for someone else. It's that their every thought is about how to help, how to solve suffering, how to aid, how to sacrifice. Do you see the disparity between these two types of mind stream? Our mind stream, which is characterized by me, myself, and I, and the bodhisattva's mind stream, which is called bodhicitta, which is all about you. It's all about you. This is why all the great masters of all the great traditions came to this planet for you. Krishna came to restore the law for you. Jesus came to set a new precedent 
with the law for you. Samael and Vior came for you to give you something so essential and important that he was willing to give his very blood. And he did. Do you see the difference between their mind and our mind? That is the great challenge that we face. To turn our mind stream into that. It can be done. It can be done in one life. If you start now. If you work constantly, consistently at turning that mind stream away from the delusion of grasping at oneself and towards the truth that all beings are suffering because of our actions. That life is impermanent. That love, real love, exists and that there is a way to reach liberation from suffering through that real love. That is bodhicitta, the difference. And what is most amazing about it, about bodhicitta, is that anyone can do it. Anyone. We just have to have the will to do it. You see, this word citta is related to will, to volition. Do we have the will to do it? Right now, our will is all trapped in attachment to material things, attachment to sensations, attachment to false sense of self. Our soul, in other words, is trapped in the ego. Our soul is this bodhi or buddhi, the essence. That soul is a portion of the sephra, the sephra tiferet, the center of the tree of life, the human soul. It is an essence of that, a seed. Tiferet represents willpower, conscious will. Our conscious will is trapped in ego, in crime, in violence, in laziness, indifference, apathy, doubt, cynicism. When we cultivate bodhicitta, we cultivate optimism, hopefulness, conscious love, the virtue of sacrifice, generosity, diligence. Heroic action. We call these qualities paramitas, or conscious attitudes. These are distinguishing characteristics of bodhicitta. When we cultivate and develop those, we're awakening bodhicitta. This is a quality of mind stream related with tiferet, with our essence. If you've studied this teaching for a while, you've heard about the creation of the soul, or the bodies of the soul, rather. The astral body, the mental body, and the causal body. In Tibetan Buddhism, they have other names. Christianity, they have other names. In the Kabbalah, they're called by different names. The Merkaba. These bodies of the soul are important. They are vessels or vehicles through which the light can be uh, directed. But they are not bodhicitta. To create the mental body has nothing to do with bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is a mind stream, but it is not the mental body. Neither is it the causal body related with tiferet. In fact, you can cultivate bodhicitta without creating the solar bodies. That means if you're a single person working with transmutation, you can create bodhicitta. Now, normally, the single people who study these teachings get discouraged quickly because they all, all they hear about is the creation of the bodies and they feel that this is so important to create the bodies. Yeah, it's important. But more important than that is the creation of bodhicitta. Why? The only way anyone can become a bodhisattva, an essence of Christ, an incarnation of Christ is if they have bodhicitta first. Now you can develop bodhicitta any time in your path. Even if you're a Nirvani Buddha, you can develop it. You already have your solar bodies. You can start developing it. 
You can never become a bodhisattva without bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the environment within which the bodhisattva is formed. It's in that environment of conscious love and comprehension of the absolute that the bodhisattva is created. Moreover, even if a bodhisattva who has those solar bodies falls into devolution, into the abyss, and is recycled by nature, and their solar bodies over countless eons are destroyed, the bodhicitta is never destroyed. That is astonishing. Because the bodhicitta is the very quality of their mind. It's different. That's how important this is. Bodhicitta becomes a permanent part of the mind stream that pervades every aspect of our psychology and spirituality. It's that important. That's why every religion emphasizes love. Not terrestrial love, conscious love, supernal love, something beyond the mind. This, in its synthesis, is the Mahayana ethic. In the lectures up till now, we've talked about sutrayana or foundational level. Now we're talking about Mahayana ethics. To help us, I'd like to recommend a practice to you. Most people have a natural affinity towards some particular religion or some particular master. It could be Jesus. It could be Krishna or Buddha or Padmasambhava. It could be Gayatri, Athena. It might be Durga. Any god or goddess from any religion that you feel a natural affinity towards, get a picture, a picture that inspires you. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be fancy. You can find thousands of them on the Internet. Get one and put it on your altar. And every day, look at that picture and contemplate this concept of bodhicitta and pray for that deity to help you to understand it. Then, close your eyes and visualize that picture, that image, and make it real in your mind. And imagine that deity coming down into your heart and mind and becoming you. You become that so that that deity can help you to act that way with love, with compassion, the way a Buddha would, the way a God would. This is how you can start to teach your mind stream about bodhicitta by the intervention of these deities. They will help you. I'm talking about truly elevated deities. Don't pick a picture or a, a person or a saint or a person physically. Pick a founder of a religion, a very high being, someone that you know or you strongly feel is related with the Christic path, the direct path. And these would be Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, Quetzalcoatl, Mary, Avalokiteshvara. All of these deities convey to us this type of teaching, if we ask for it, if we call upon them to help us, they will. And particularly if you do this practice, to pray, to close your eyes, and visualize this deity helping you. You can go a step further. If you're having a real problem with something, especially with another person, you're really struggling with another person, pray and visualize that situation and that problem that you're having, and ask for the help of this deity to help you see what is the right way for you to behave. Open your mind to that. Open your consciousness to receiving that kind of guidance, and you will. But to do it, you have to open your mind. That's not always easy, especially when you're really feeling resentment. You're really angry with someone. It's not easy. Do you have any questions about this lecture? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Avalokiteshvara is a Sanskrit name for Christ. Avalokiteshvara is a, an entity or a depiction of an energy. The most common form is a standing deity that has a thousand arms. You may have seen this. A thousand arms reaching out, and oftentimes many heads. It could be 13. It's usually about how many. This is a very deep symbol of the ray of creation of Christ, Christus, compassionate love. And those thousand arms are there because that compassion from God is so strong that he reaches out in uncountable number of ways in order to aid others. So in the Hindu tradition and the Buddhist tradition, this is the symbol of Christ, where in Christianity we talk about Jesus, the Christ. It's the same symbol. Avalokiteshvara sacrifices constantly to aid beings. Now, what's beautiful also is there's a story that says that when Avalokiteshvara looked down on humanity and saw how much suffering there was, he felt so much love that a tear sprang out of his eye, and that tear became Tara, who's here. Tara, white Tara in Tibetan Buddhism. Tara means star. But Tara represents that pure compassion that's taken a form, a body, and to come down to earth to help us. Tara is just the female aspect of Avalokiteshvara. It's the same entity, the same uh, force, bodhicitta, in its perfect aspect. Male and female, Tara and Avalokiteshvara. Tara is very popular in Tibetan Buddhism. Because Tibetan Buddhism focuses so much on the cultivation of bodhicitta. It's a deep Mahayana tradition. And what's beautiful is that Tara relates well with um, many other symbols in other religions, such as Virgin Mary, or Sarasvati, or Lakshmi, or Durga, or Athena. These virgin goddesses who always represent the love of the mother. And they have that symbolism because most people can comprehend how selfless the love of a mother is, right? To some degree, especially someone who's been a parent can understand that. That's what these gods and goddesses represent, that quality in us. But that goes beyond mere terrestrial love of parent to child. It becomes a type of love that can embrace all existing beings. So when we think about this, look at the capacity of your own heart. How much love do you have? Most of us rarely experience full flowering of love in our heart. And when we do, it's usually just for one person, maybe two. And usually it's conflicted and colored with resentment and fears and anxieties. Generally, it's not very strong or pure and it doesn't last. It doesn't sustain itself. It kind of comes and goes. The love of a bodhisattva is here represented in Tara or Avalokiteshvara. It is a heart that has the capacity to embrace all living beings with so much love. It's unimaginable. And yet, it's the very purpose of us being alive, is to become that. So that, if you really contemplate this, it can turn your whole life around. Instead of life being something that's always painful, always discouraging, always filled with doubt and anxiety and uncertainty and pain, it can become something purposeful. When you take on this type of teaching, a Mahayana teaching, you take on the suffering of others with optimism, with hope, knowing in yourself it can be done. It can be. If it were not possible, we wouldn't have this teaching. It would be over already. No bodhisattva would have come and given us this if it were impossible but it is possible if we do it, if we take it seriously and transform our daily lives. <coughs> Another question? All right. Right. To, to be in self-remembering means to remember God with a capital S on the self. It means to 
to generate an awareness to sense the presence of God. It's really hard to put it into words because it's not something intellectual. The intellect can't get it. It's something you have to do with a pressure in your consciousness and your awareness. You have to reach out with your awareness and feel that, sense that. There is something more than just this mind. There's something more than just this body. There's something more than just these surging emotions. What is that something more? It's to keep that receptive sense active and reaching out and sensing God. In the beginning, it's not easy because we've lost touch with it. But as you sustain that effort, and as you experience more, and as you meditate more, and as you work on your ego more, it becomes natural because it is natural. It's normal. In ancient times, we always felt the presence of God. We didn't have to try. It was symbolized in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God. They knew God. They saw God. They talked to God. It wasn't something abnormal. It's normal. We should be like that. We're not because of our mind. But when we make the effort to separate consciousness from ego, we make that ego passive, and we make the consciousness active, that sense recovers. It restores itself. Another question in the back? Yeah, that's a long question, but a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, the synthesis of the question is, it, it's a bit of a conundrum or catch-22 to practice these three trainings because to have wisdom, you need concentration, and to have concentration, you need ethics. But to have ethics, you need concentration and wisdom. But this is true. You see, what it reveals, what that question reveals is that this path is not intellectual. It isn't something that you can just, you know, it's not like reading a book where you read one chapter and you're done. It doesn't work that way. This is something dynamic and alive. These three trainings are cyclical or uh, reciprocal, we could say. They feed each other. They support each other. We start where we are. We start where we are. The most important uh, aspect that we need to develop first is ethics, renunciation. And yeah, your understanding of ethics and renunciation will only go as far as your comprehension of it, which is reached through meditation. So right there are the three trainings. You can't wait to begin comprehending and having wisdom. You can't wait to meditate. You can't wait to develop ethics. You have to develop them all at the same time. But they work in a very specific way with each other. You have to understand that. That is, if you're a beginner, if you're struggling, work on being conscious of yourself. That's the very first thing, more than anything else. Learn to be cognizant of your mind from moment to moment. Keep working on your self-awareness. That naturally develops concentration. It takes concentration to do it. Not only that, it naturally develops wisdom. Because as you watch yourself, you start to become aware of how stupid you are, how many mistakes you're making, how many assumptions you're making, how many things you are ignoring in your life, in your mind. That effort to self-observe naturally initiates all three aspects of the three trainings. So start there. But also meditate. Practice concentration in meditation practice. Also practice developing wisdom. Do the retrospection practice that we've been talking about. It's absolutely essential. And of course, 
These three trainings will go nowhere if you're wasting energy. If you're fornicating, if you're sleeping around, if you're drinking alcohol, you're smoking, you're destroying your body through all kinds of bad habits, your three trainings will go nowhere because you're filling your mind with all kinds of uh, discursive energies that will destabilize it. For this to succeed, you need a stable mind and a persistent effort. A question here? Yeah, the, the tradition relates that when yogis or Buddhas reach nirvana and they become established there, they don't suffer in the way that they used to, in the way that we do. So they don't understand that. They forget. It's like in the same way um, when you change from one life situation to another one, you tend to forget the old way of thinking, the way you were back then. And you don't understand people in that stage the way you did when you were there. Like adults and kids, there's always this inability to comprehend each other. It's somewhat similar to that. The difference is that for a Buddha or a yogi who's reached that level, they haven't really reached liberation. And they become deluded by the pleasure, the bliss. And that acts as a sort of veil, not only to their own suffering, because their suffering still persists, but it's a different kind. It's a suffering of being attached to a different kind of self, being attached to being a Buddha. That ultimately doesn't exist and ultimately will end. All things are impermanent. So that state of Buddhahood will end and they will undergo terrible suffering because they'll descend again and lose that and have to start over. So it's a subtle thing for us to grasp, but uh, very dangerous. So it's better for us in the beginning to start cultivating a path that goes beyond that. Instead of remaining in an introductory level, to go ahead and shoot for the complete path. Otherwise, we waste lives. We waste time. Was there another question in the back? How to not identify with finding a spouse. This is a hard challenge for a single person, especially knowing that the, the path itself requires that the, at certain levels to have a spouse. No matter what our situation, no matter what our problems, if you really work to comprehend the sutrayana level, you will come to a single conclusion, which is your situation is determined by you. We are what we are because of our mind. This is the very first line of the Dhammapada, the Buddha's teaching. We are what we are because of our mind. Our external circumstances exist because of our internal condition. This is a hard concept for it to sink into us as we have a long, long habit of thinking otherwise. It takes a long process of contemplation to comprehend this. We are what we are. We experience what we experience. We have what we have because of what we are, because of how we've behaved because of the actions we've performed. Therefore, if we want to change our situation, we have to change our behavior. Simple. Jesus gave a great teaching on this. I mentioned it in a, another lecture recently. It's in that chapter, the famous uh, sermon that he gave. when he said, why do you worry about what you will eat, what you will wear? Don't you see that God provides to the flowers and the birds everything they need? 
And aren't you, as a human being, much more precious to God than a bird or a flower? So won't he also provide you with everything you need? It's undeniable. It's a truth. If we are single, we are getting what we need. If we are in a couple, we are getting what we need. However, this doesn't mean that everything we have came from God. Most of what we have came from our wrong actions, from our past behaviors, good or bad. But nowadays, the most of what we experience is from things we've done that were not right, not proper. And so we suffer. In the, I think it was in the epistles. Anyway, later on in the New Testament, I believe it was Paul who said, let every man accept what God has given him. That means if you're single, accept that. Take advantage of it. The fact is, whatever your situation in life, it is karmic. That means that you're receiving it in order to pay what you owe. If you want to change your situation, pay your debt. Don't resist it. Don't run away from it. If you avoid paying your debt, you only accrue more interest, right? If you get a parking ticket from the city and you avoid it, you only deepen your problems, right? It's the same with the cosmic laws. When you get your karma coming at you, and if you start complaining and blaming everybody else and avoiding your responsibilities, you only make it worse. We have to cultivate acceptance. We have to accept our responsibility, and we have to change. This is why we receive our karma. We receive it for our own good. Do you know who gives you your karma? Do you know who's the one who makes you take it? Your being. We always think it's our boss, our spouse. It's the devil. No. It is the devil. But it's Lucifer who is the shadow of your innermost. He's part of that. He's the one who gives you your problems. For your own good. To tempt you. To teach you. That's why we call Lucifer our psychological trainer. We need him. He knows our mind all the way to its very bottom. And he knows what we can handle. And believe me, he will push you right to your limit. But if you learn to accept that, to take it, like Jesus taking his cross, taking it not just for himself, but for others. You can transform everything. This is the great beauty of this teaching. The chief quality of the Mahayana teaching is generosity. Not generosity like, let me give you all the money in my wallet. Or let me give you these old things I don't need anymore. That's usually what we think of as generosity. Like we go and clean our garage out and give it to some charity and we think, oh, we're so generous. <laughs> to give away things we don't need. This is not generosity. That's just a clever way of getting rid of your garbage. <laughs> right? Real generosity is when you give from your heart what the other person truly needs. No matter the cost to you. Real generosity is when that mother gives to the child the last bit of food and doesn't eat herself, but gives to her child. Real generosity is when you spontaneously give to someone else without being asked, without receiving praise, without receiving thanks. In fact, you might even get slapped, criticized, and spit upon, but you give it because they need it. That's generosity. That's Mahayana. That's Bodhicitta. This is the attitude we have to cultivate. When we cultivate that attitude, no matter what our problems, no matter what our suffering, we take that and transform it for the good of everyone. So we start having problems at work. We start having problems with our spouse. Instead of blaming them, instead of attacking them, instead of complaining to all our friends, oh, 
My spouse is making me suffer so much. I hate so-and-so. Instead, we turn it around and we say, I deserve it. This is my karma. And we show gratitude even to the executioner. If you've read the books of Samael and Vior, you'll remember this line. We have to kiss the whip of the one who whips us. We have to kiss the hand of the executioner who comes to kill us. We have to show gratitude for all the unpleasant manifestations of our fellow men. Who here has that capacity? I don't, but I'm trying. And when I've been able to taste it, it's extremely transformative. When you really are able to bring that quality bodhicitta, concern for others, not for oneself. It totally transforms the entire situation. When someone's angry with you, attacking you, calling you names, and instead of feeling hurt and blaming them and justifying yourself, you realize, wow, they're really suffering. Whether I really did something wrong or not doesn't matter. Because they are suffering. You see, there's no thought of me. It's the thought of the other person. That transforms everything. Not only does it transform me, it transforms the situation. I'm not responding with anger in kind. I'm not responding with criticism and blame and gossip and attacks. But with love. With patience. With acceptance. With understanding. Can you imagine if some of our politicians had that capacity? how different our world would be? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how different our world would be if some of the corporate CEOs had this ability? Instead of seeking to fatten their own pockets with huge checks, if they were concerned more about other people and the impact of their companies on humanity? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen if our religious leaders truly had bodhicitta and thought more about the well-being of the people in their parish than the image of their church? Can you imagine what a different world it would be? We can make that. But you have to do it. Is there another question? <laughs> Probably the short one, because it's getting late. Uh, go to the other question, please. I don't know the answer to that one. The next question. Could you explain how beings who reach liberation free themselves of being owed anything? I guess my question would be, how would someone go beyond karma? Is it because they are born beyond the causal, causal world, or is karma beyond the causal world as well? Okay, the question is about how one goes beyond karma and develops perfect equilibrium. Uh, the question is a little bit misformed because karma is eternal. You can never go beyond karma. Karma is everywhere. Karma exists in all levels. Karma is simply cause and effect. There is no such thing as a place without cause and effect. Even the absolute, which in itself is beyond concept, beyond form, beyond spirit, nonetheless is a form of cause and effect, but beyond this level. So to reach that, you don't go beyond karma. Rather, you master it. This level of entering to the absolute is beyond good and bad, yes. It is beyond that duality. But what exists at that level is something called the three gunas, or triguna. And this is um, three qualities of existence, which are, it's a very subtle and difficult concept to grasp. But in synthesis, we can say to go beyond existence, one has to be perfectly in balance with the characteristics of existence, these three gunas. When that happens, you go through the door to the absolute. It's exceedingly rare. Jesus did it. 
Not only did he do it, he came back. This is even more rare. In different religions, you can hear about the paramatasatyas, or these beings that have the capacity to go that far. These are beings that are dharmakayas and beyond, who've incarnated kater and gone beyond. These are all resurrected masters, very high. But rarely, if ever, do you hear of a being coming back. Jesus did that. For one reason. For you. To help all beings to reach that same level. So we'll end there. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,